Uh, this morning, I'm going to start a new series. I thought I was going to start this last week. Uh, this year, I kind of have been challenged by God. You know, as a pastor, I tend to fall into routines. None of us in here ever fall into routines. Uh, but the way I preach, uh, what I preach, it, it typically comes the same way. I'm a very topical preacher in what I do. I like series that kind of communicate thoughts that I can dig into Scripture. And God really challenged me to preach through a book. Well, I mean, I set the bar real high, so I started looking for the shortest books. Right? Come on. And so I got into the book of Jude, and I was studying the book of Jude. I read the book of Jude several times. And, 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 and I was going to preach through, I mean, I'm ambitious. I'm going to preach through the book of Jude. Last week, that was what I was intending to do before I felt like God shifted my heart. I had a sermon title, Hey Jude. I mean, come on. And there's, a, there's a scripture in there. This is all coming together. This is going to be good. But I wasn't ready last week, so I figured I'd work on it. During worship last week, Walt was praying. He prayed a scripture from the Old Testament that took me to a place in the New Testament and God laid on my heart a different book that I'm going to be preaching through in the next several weeks. Probably not verse by verse because that still a little bit stretches me too much. But we're going to go through what I think are some of the main thoughts in this, in this book. And so the book that God had me land on is one of the epistles that, that we attribute to being written by Paul. And if you recall, Paul was very influential in the early church. He wrote several letters to churches to strengthen and encourage them. He was very apostolic in how he addressed them, so he could write the hard letters that, like, pastors didn't want to write. So when pastors had problems, they called up Paul. They Snapchat him or something, so he could, he could go ahead and give them uh, the information they needed to his people. And so this is the scenario. The book that we're going to look at is going to be the book of Colossians. And I will be honest, this morning is probably going to be a lot of information. Uh, I want to have a good picture of the context of this book uh, before we get into the content, because often the context helps us understand the content better. So if you're visiting us this morning, or you're not planning on being here, and you come here regularly, all these messages will be on the short version on Facebook, the long version on YouTube, whichever one you want to engage in. Um, but today really is just setting the context of this book and looking at the major theme that I've that I've identified. So I said now, here's another, can I be another candid pastor Steve? Can, can we all admit our mistakes sometimes? So the book of Colossians was written to the church in Colossae. Now this is where I'm going to be candid pastor Steve because my wife told me even on the devotion of faith, I always pronounced it Colossae. But I looked it up because if I'm going to be preaching on this, I better say it right. And what I saw was that this town is actually pronounced Colossae. And so sometime today, I will probably say Colossae. Uh, I'll give you a quarter. If you, if you identify it, you better go to the car and get lots of quarters. Um, but, but so Paul is writing a letter to the church in Colossae. Now, I, I need to look at this map because the reality of this map it shows the miracle of this book. So likely, this letter was written from prison in Rome. Paul wrote this letter while he was in prison in Rome. This letter was written to a church that is all the way over here. I Google mapped it because that's what we do today. 29 hour drive. I mean, the miracle of this epistle, this letter, is that Paul is in prison in Rome, and this is a letter that's going to get to a church that's on the other side of their world. Another compelling part of, of this letter, this epistle, is the church, the Colossian church was not a church that Paul started. A lot of the churches we see uh, that Paul is writing a letter to are either churches he started or he's visited. He's never even been to the church in Colossae. This isn't a church that, that he can say, hey, I've been there, I've witnessed with you. But the story of this church, and, 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 and I've discerned this, this is my interpretation of some of this, so give me a little bit of liberty as I'm trying to figure this out. Like, why? The question I ask, why would Paul <coughs> write a book to a church on the other side of the world that he's never been to? It's pretty arrogant. 
I mean, does he really think he's that important? But then I read the book of, of Philemon. In that book, there's an interesting phrase because there's an interesting piece in that book that, that there were two gentlemen who were in prison together. One was the name Epaphras, and the other one was a guy by the name of Paul. So Paul and Epaphras, at some point, are in prison together. Do you know who Epaphras is? <coughs> He's the pioneer and pastor of the church of Colossae. And so this is where Pastor Steve is maybe interpreting a little bit. But I have to assume if you're in prison together, you're looking for stuff to talk about. That first was likely a convert of Paul's. According to a lot of theologians, he was probably someone who came to the faith through Paul's ministry. So if you're Pastor E, because it's easier than saying Epaphras, and you're in prison with Pastor P, just because if we're going by E, P's got to feel good, I'm going to ask him every question possible. I mean, this is a guy that I've heard about. This is a guy that's, that's invested in me. This is a guy who I know. I'm going to start talking to him about my church. This is me. When I'm around pastors who serve for a long time, I just like to get close to them and ask them questions about church stuff. Yeah, I recognize that church isn't the same today as it was 30 years ago, but I still want to pick into their wisdom and knowledge and understanding like it's just a wise investment of my time. They've got to be locked in a room for me to be able to do that sometimes, but you know what I mean? Like That's literally what's happening with, with, with Paul and Pastor E. Like they're together. This is, again, this is me interpreting through what I read the scripture. And so he's, he's talking to Paul about the church. Now the church in Colossae, it, it's a good church. Things are actually going really well there. In his letter, this is when Paul starts his letter saying, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all God's people. Now, Pastor Steve, candid moment. If someone describes our church, I hope they describe us this way. Remember, we exist to love God and love people make an impact in our world. <laughs> this is not what Paul's saying. He's heard, I've heard about your love for God and your love for people. I've heard about your faith in God and your faith in people. You're living the purpose. The church at Colossae, it was, it was a happening church. This young whippersnapper who got saved in Paul's ministry, he's leading the trending church. But, he began to talk to Paul, where I know Paul addresses some issues that the church was having. I mean, you hear this introduction, man, it sounds like everything is great. But where this church was, it was dealing with issues. It was dealing with some problems. Doesn't that seem to happen? The longer we are, the more things that influence us. Good or bad. It just seems like things start to permeate in. And so the issues that this church was dealing with, the church in Colossae, that it was dealing with, the first thing was it was dealing with secularism. It's a big word for what? All the people were basically trying to take the one true God out of what they were doing. So the influence, where they were at, they were mostly a Gentile uh, a church, but there was a large Greek influence around them. There was a large intellectual influence around them. Now, I, I, I find this compelling when I read about the church in, in Colossae, because I think it mirrors pretty much the church today. Okay? Uh, they're dealing with people who are saying to them that there is no God. Like you don't really have to lean on a God. You don't have to trust in a God. You don't have to worry about God. Because we can do this ourselves. We're smart enough, we're wise enough, we can figure out the problems. We don't need the crutch of God. Now that's one influence that's coming into this church. You know, another influence that's coming into this church is the influence of spiritualism. I talked about there was, there, was, there was a Greek influence, and if I went back to that map, they're pretty close to Asia, and there's an Eastern religious influence as well. So then what they're saying, some are saying, you don't need no gods, and others are saying, hey, let's just look at all gods. Like that Apollo guy, he's pretty cool. Like, let's put him in our pocket when we need him. Like lightning bolts, we can get some Zeus. We got some Buddhists so we can be enlightened. You know, we got some Buddha. I mean, all these things. And they're just saying, and basically, they're saying to the people who, who 
were the people who were known for their faith and love. They're saying to them, hey, guess what? All these things are good. And if there's good in all things, then why don't we just incorporate them into the love? Then they can have a better faith if we just believe in all these things. So there were the there were the secularists, there were the spiritualists, the ones that wanted no gods, and the ones that wanted all gods, and in the midst of that, there were the legalists. Because there were some Jews who were around there. And guess what they're telling the people? We gotta follow the law. It's a group of Gentiles. Do you want to get Gentile men stirred up? You start talking about circumcision. But literally, that's what's happening. They're like having church fights over circumcision. So what I see is this pastor, the, the, the pastor Epaphras, he's sitting down with Paul and he's saying, Paul, I mean, everything is going great on the outside. Like, we're accomplishing good things. But here's, here's the struggle. Here's what I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with some who are telling my people that we don't need God. Like we arrive, like we're doing things. Like the way we've got things rolling, if God shows up, cool, but it doesn't matter because we can do this really well. We got others who are telling us that we need more gods because they can help our God do what we need to do. And then we got the Jews who are telling us that we're just not enough. And all these voices are speaking into the church. And so Paul writes a letter. Let's put it in my name, not yours. I'm going to address some of the hard things. I'm going to talk about some of the big things. And so Paul writes a letter to the Colossian church. That's the letter that I want to look at. But what I see, this is Pastor Steve. Oh, wait a minute. For a picture of this church. So we have a church that was described by Paul as one who was known for their love of God and for for their faith in God and for loving people. In chapter 2 of Colossians, there's another church that, in this letter, he incorporates with his address. Twelve miles away, there's a group of people in Laodicea. And so, I think the picture we see in Revelation is probably a good understanding of what's happening in the church of, of Colossians. Revelation chapter 3, uh, this is the word to the church. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the Amen. The faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, but you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I'm rich, I've acquired wealth, I do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are a wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and, and naked. Like, isn't that interesting to see that scripture along with this one that we read just a second ago? If this is how the church in, in Colossae is described, and this is how the church in Laodicea is described, and they're kind of one church, it's being addressed at the same time. What happened? It was the effect of all these things in the midst of the church. Why Pastor Steve is so compelled by these verses is, is that I am compelled that the church continues to move forward in all that God has for us. And the warning I see to the church in Colossae is a warning that I think could be spoken to the church in Crawford. Hey, you guys are doing a good job loving God and loving people. But all of a sudden, God's described this as one that he wants to spit out of his mouth. What happened between A and B? What was Paul speaking to help us not get to point B when we were already at point A? And if Paul is speaking that to them, maybe he would speak that to us so that we could be aware, that we could be on our guard. History is the greatest teacher, right? Moni is not in here right now, or she would just jumped up and down and said amen. I love these, these stories, these letters to the churches because there's something for me to learn from. That something for me is that I don't want to become complacent in who I am and I need to recognize the voices that are speaking to me that may be separating me from the plan and purpose God has for our lives. So Paul says his answer today. 
what I believe is the, the main theme of the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. If you want to go there, you say, well, he made him wait a little while before he got there. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. He's, he's begun to address some issues in the midst of this. This is the middle of the book. Um, he'll address some more after this. But he says, since then, you've been raised with Christ. This is what I would say if you could come up with the thesis, the theme, uh, the synopsis of his letter to the church in Colossians. Like, if he was the pastor and was saying, take one note down, this would have been his one note for the church in, 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 in Colossians. He said to them, set your hearts on things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden in, with Christ in God. It's interesting, I put up the New King James because the New King James reads a little bit different in this verse. If you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Now what did... In the first one, it said, set your hearts and set your minds. This one says, seek those things uh, which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, and set your mind on things above. So the question that we should ask, why does one say set your heart and one say seek? Because the whole premise for Pastor Steve is setting your heart and your mind on, on the things that are above. And so if I, if I teach a sermon series on why we're setting our heart and mind, I better know why one doesn't say heart and one does. There's a word that's used in this, in this verse, if you go back and you look at the Greek, where that word seek is in, in, in the Colossians, in the, in the King James one. It's the word zeteo. Literally, that word means to desire. It's a position of, of, of desire. So when, when the guys that were writing this in the NIV read it, they said, yeah, I understand seeking, but I think it's important that we, we identify what we're seeking with, that our desires are set on the things that are above. Yes, to seek, that probably is a position of our desire, but the reality is that we're setting our hearts in our minds on things that are above. Now what's interesting to Pastor Steve, like I said, this is a lot of teaching, I'm going to get to preaching in just a second. When Jesus was asked about the greatest commandment in all the law, what did he say? And he adds one in this, this is Matthew chapter 22, teacher which is the greatest commandment in all the law. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Now Paul, who is an apostle writing to a church in Colossae, he's trying to, to set them on the right path, to help them get back, to recalibrate them, using a big church cliche word right now. He's trying to get them back in the pattern in which they need to be. What does he say to them? Is he not speaking almost the identical words that Jesus Christ said? He said, you know what? Things have been going well. You've been doing good things. You've been loving people. But now, when I want to talk to you, when I need to help you, you've got to do one thing or two things. You've got to set your heart and you've got to set your mind on things that are above. Jesus said the greatest commandment in all the law, to set your heart and set your mind on things that are above. God is above us, right? Isn't Jesus and Paul saying the same thing? It's something that's consistent in Scripture, yet I think we need to be reminded daily about setting our hearts in our minds on things that are above. Paul is speaking to a church that thinks it's been going well. He's speaking to believers who some may consider mature, but he's saying, if I can give you any nugget, if I can give you anything, set your heart and set your mind on the things that are above. Apparently there's something with our heart position and our head position and walking with the Lord. Seek with 
what you desire. Let your heart position. Yeah, he's not talking about your physical heart and, and, and his brain. He, he's talking when he says, seek with all your heart. That's a Greek word, cardia, like cardiac. You get it? The, the, the whole thing. It's the catalyst that's within us for our emotions. It's that place, it's that desire place inside of us. Now, I want to ask, and, and, and don't answer this out loud because I don't want people to judge you because, you know, none of us are a perfect church. Are your desires set on the things that are above? Now, pastor doesn't like that question sometimes because sometimes pastor preaches to himself. But Paul is looking at a church and he's saying, guess what, I see that's happening. Your desires, what you're seeking, isn't on the things that are above. You know, too often we're focused upon seeking things of this world. They're limited things. We set our hearts like, man, I, I, I've counseled enough, enough young people. I've talked to enough individuals like, just let me get through this season and then I'll get to the things of God. Let me live a little bit. Let me have fun. Let me, let me, let me graduate high school. Let me go to college. Let me graduate college. Let me retire. Let me, let me live my retirement. Let me die. And then I'll get to the things of God. Like, literally, we set our hearts. Our desires are so compelled on the things of this world. What Paul sees as he's looking at the Colossian church is a people who are seeking the things of this world. Like, they had a really cool article written about the church and policy. You know what I mean? Like everybody's recognizing us. We're doing articles in Enrichment Magazine and, and Pastor Everfresh, he's got his own, his own podcast with 65,000. There's nothing wrong with all of that. Paul says, if you want to calibrate, if you want to check yourself, are your desires set on the things of the love? He chooses to be like Jesus because we're all called to be Christ-like, so he can't just stop the heart. He's got to go ahead. But you know, right? Isn't that really what everyone was wrestling with him about? Like, do you know enough? Like, set your head. That what you understand. This whole book, if you if you read this book with me throughout these next few weeks, it talks about understanding and knowledge. But too often, I, I mentioned the path, the journey, the, the academic path we've gone on. I was thinking in worship, if we set our minds on things above, like we set our minds on things below, huh? What do you mean? Do we have Google now and YouTube? If I set my mind on things below, I can learn anything I want. Huh? Come on. We've all been here. We don't know how to do it, so what do we do? We give a little video. And it starts teaching us how to do something. And you know what we do? We watch the next video because we want to learn more. And we watch the next video because we want to learn more. And all of a sudden, we spend more time watching videos on things in this world than we ever have set our minds on things above. I'm going to pick on Carol because she's not here. She, she always would say, this was a phrase, quite, not always, but she used this phrase a few times, that people are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. And I was thinking about that phrase in worship as well. I don't think it's possible to be too heavenly minded to be no earthly good. I understand the content in which she's saying it. I understand the context in which she's saying it. But I think that's a lie at the end. Because if I'm setting my mind on the things above, guess what God's going to do? He's going to point me to the things 
beloved. He's going to point me to the things of this earth. Why? Because God came that all of us would have life and have it to the full. He so loved us that he sent his one only son that we could all enjoy the promises of heaven together. So if we are focusing, if we're setting, we still not like we're living in heaven yet. We're setting our minds on the things that are above. See, that's the backfields. Huh? Sometimes we think the battlefield is in our body. I believe the battlefield is in our heart and our mind. I believe it's the battlefield that was happening in, in, in Colossae, and I believe it's the battlefield that's happening in Crawford. Because what happens is we start setting our minds on the finite things around us. Everything in this world is limited apart from the kingdom of God. You hear that? When we set our desires on the things of this world, our desires will either be fulfilled or unfulfilled, but it's not the kingdom desires that God has for us. We can try to be satisfied with stuff. We can try to be satisfied with things. We can try to be satisfied with fame or social status. We can try to be satisfied by acceptance or those that are around us, but that is absolutely limited. We got a pretty short lifespan. Mm -hmm. Huh? Whereas we will say 120 years for your sake. Probably 120 years. My hope is bigger than 120 years. My desires are more. It's one of the amount of time that it would be on this earth. My understanding, the things of my mind, they're not limited by the things of this world. Do you know how many times that we see in Scripture that God does stuff that doesn't make sense to man? How many times do we see people trying to bring it? I'm telling you, it's happening in our world today. What are people saying? I talk about spiritualism and secularism. People are telling us today there's more ways to heaven. But a loving God wouldn't send anyone to hell. People are telling us that how you feel is what should govern you. That what makes you happy is what you should do. It's coming in the midst of us that's setting our minds and our hearts on the things that are around us. Because I'm fine He's using the same strategies. He's doing the same things. We think we know enough that we can do whatever we want to do. We can make things and we can make life and we can make people from sheep. I remember a conversation in High school with a guy that was super, super smart. I mean, he had a mind. And every time I had, and you want to know what he told me? He said, "It's all right if I go to hell because eventually my nerve endings will burn up and I won't hurt anymore." <laughs> you know, Jesus encountered this with Paul. I mean, it was Paul, it was Peter, sorry. Remember, Jesus is revealing his plan to his disciples, and he tells them in this big setting, like, here's what's coming. I'm going to be handed over, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to die. And Peter said, what? Well, no, Lord, that's, that's, that's never, that's never going to happen. I'm telling you, one of the strongest rebukes in Scripture, you got the whole whitewash can thing that Jesus said to you, but this is right up there with that. Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. Why? But you're not thinking of the things of God. You're not thinking of the big picture. You're not thinking of, of Dad's plans with what's happened through this death and resurrection. 
You're not thinking about the reality that the sin of this world is going to be forgiven in, 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 in this moment that's coming. What you're thinking about are not in the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. We get so sidetracked because of our human desires and our human des concerns. We get off of the plans of God, the purposes that God has for us as a fellowship when we become by our human concerns and our human desires. God will give us the desires of our heart. In my heart and mind. Set on the things that are above. You guys can come forward. I got one quote. It was in red in my notes, and I don't want to miss it. It says in my in my notes that too often heart and mind are governed by this world and not by its kingdom. And I have warning written. This is in red. When our hearts and minds are defined by this world, we're living limited lives. You hear that? When my desires and concerns are defined by this world, I'm limiting my life. Because I'm not setting it on the infinite. I'm setting it on the finite. There is an end to the finite. There is an end to the limited. There is no end to what He has. There's no end to the infinite. There's no end to the eternal. So I want to set my mind there because there's no end. Doesn't matter. Even when I don't feel it. Huh? Remember that song? You guys all sang it before. You sang my sermon already. <laughs> huh? <clears throat> That's your heart position. Even when I don't feel it. <laughs> Even when I don't see it. That's your head position. Why? Because you're working. Setting my mind on the things that are above. Yeah, my concerns, I don't feel it, I don't see it, I don't know it, I don't smell it. But I know you. Colossians starts on this, it, it, it emphasizes the supremacy of Jesus Christ and that as his children, there's something greater for each one of us. You know, I did a lot of studies and in math, I got a degree in it. Calculus is all based on the infinite. The infinite is always greater. What's the largest number you can come up with? Just keep going. Ten. ten Eight and a half. The infinite is always greater. Over the next few weeks, I want to see some of the greater that, that Peter talks to. He says there's something greater than this lifestyle for us. There's something greater than for you. There's something greater than for us in the body of, of Christ. He said there's a hope that's greater. We're going to look at hope that's greater. We're going to look at patience or endurance that is greater. There's a greater patience and endurance that we can have when we look at the things above. There's greater qualification that we can have when we look at the things that are above. There is greater riches or treasures that he has for, for those who are in his kingdom through Christ Jesus. There's greater connection. Well, we have talked last week about the bones. And he said something about the sinews and muscles or whatever he said. He talks about it in the book of Colossians. There's greater connection. Maybe some of this will hit better. It's greater close. He's got a better look here. Paul's word church and philosophy is my word to you today. 
Church, I want the greater thing. Our desires, 
But above it all, I just want what God has. Above it all, I want to hear His voice. Above it all, I want Him to see it and give it to me. Our minds. You know, we take captive those thoughts, those arguments, those lies that set themselves up against the knowledge of God, the lies that tell us that we can live apart from what the Word of God says, the lies that tell us that we need to govern ourselves, that we need to do what we want, the lies that tell us that maybe there's more ways, or maybe there's multiple ways, the lies that tell us that maybe God isn't real, the ones that tell us that if God were really real, that He would be doing this or that. No, we're not governed but we're governed by the things that are above. This morning, is Amy, just set your heart. Set your mind on things that are above. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And I thank you for the book of Colossians. I thank you that we can look at it. I thank you for the Word of God that's living and active, and it speaks to us today. And God, in this room, as you've spoken, Spirit of God, as you've illuminated, Spirit of God, as you've revealed to us, I pray that we can respond to what you're saying. I pray that the words that we sang in worship, that even when we don't feel it, even when we don't see it, we've set our hearts and minds on the things that are above God, that this day, that the declaration in this room was, I'm going to be intentional. when I know this God, those desires, when I notice those concerns, when the world tries to redefine your kingdom, I want to set my heart and mind on things above. Because you've given us Jesus Christ the one who says the way, the truth, and the life. The one who said he came that we might have life and have it to the full. The one who is supreme, who is all and is in all. Help us to set our eyes. Set our hearts. Set our minds. One thing is in in Jesus' name. You know, prayer really is just that. It's the reality that we're focusing upon, apart from where we are to what God has promised us. This morning, if you have a need in your life, as a pastor, I want to be able to pray with you. There's other people in this room that will pray with you if you want to find them and seek them out. If you say, Pastor, I'm really struggling with, with this whole mind thing. Like, like my desires, I just want what God wants. But my mind keeps telling me arguments and things. Let me pray with you that God will help you with that. Maybe it's your desires. You have these things that you just can't seem to let go. And if you let them go today, you can see God. You can feel God. You can set your heart and mind on that which is above. We'll have time to pray as they sing this song. Set your hearts and set your minds on Christ who is all and is in. On the one who is great. The Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. May he turn his face towards you, grant you his peace. And guess what? May you set your hearts and minds on things love. Amen? Be blessed.